Hello, nerds, and welcome to the Geek Girl Story Salon, where I talk to creatives from across disciplines and across the world about the art of storytelling. I'm your host, Jen Jackalon, lifelong storyteller and head geek in charge. We've got some great guests coming up, so be sure to smash that like and subscribe button to stay up to date on the heaping helpings of brain food coming your way, courtesy of our partners, fleetoffandoms.com and Ilva Publishing, my publisher. My guest today is an R&B singer-songwriter who blends the best of classic R&B influences with a slick modern production style for a sound that puts him in some pretty impressive company. Uh, you've heard his songs on many TV soundtracks, including his ballad, Fate Don't Know You, which made waves after it appeared in the finale of Suits, and Best of Me, which appeared over the season finale of Bel Air very recently. Uh, his Instagram is filled with morning walk videos so full of positive vibes that moody 20-year-old me would have been scandalized by it. Welcome to the show. Desi Valentine. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. How are you? You're you're in New York now. What are you doing in New York? Um, I'm seeing some clients here. So um, I have uh, two different clients that I'm going to be working with and seeing some friends and eating my way through the city as always. As, as you do. <laughs> yes. As you do. Yes, yes. I actually, I lived in New York for about 13 years. It was sort of my transition into adulthood. Oh, um, wow. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's such a special city, especially at this time of the year as well. Yes. Yes. Um, so Chinatown, Little Italy. Um, and actually, Chinatown is really more kind of Asia town. So there's good Vietnamese down there. And there's, uh, um, where, do you, where do you think you might go? Mm, so I'm I'm staying in the uh, Midtown East, okay. um, mm -hmm. but I've already eaten some delicious food um, over in Soho. Mm -hmm. um, went over to buy the High Line yesterday, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. like some really interesting. We had some like tapas yesterday that was beautiful. Um, it's just such a melting pot of different food culture, yes. and I'm a, such a foodie like. Yeah, I, I do. I do enjoy your food uh, videos. Um, <laughs> but yeah, if you're in Midtown, you should. Sh there's Brazilian barbecue. Have you done that? Oh, I haven't done that. I Is think that I want to say, to? yeah, I want to say it's on 47th Street. There's like a row of Brazilian restaurants. Ooh, um, okay, I'm going to add that to my list. So there's that and there's Korean barbecue, which is also in, in Midtown. Uh, okay, like, so I love Korean barbecue too. Yes. So those those are my two recommendations that are I'm sort of close like, to where you're staying. Noted, noted. <laughs> um, so I love talking with people who are creative across a various different spectrums, and you know their journey from how they kind of got from one to the other. Um, but the first thing I want to ask is, uh, you know, you've been on stage. You know, you were start you started off in in the West End production of the producers, right? Yes. Yeah, yes. and then you did Fame at the Shaftesbury. So you had you were having this great West End career that was, you know, you were this coming up guy. And I wondered what made you decide to want to tell your own stories instead instead of starring in other people's. So I. Um, it's such an interesting story because I was in the producers at the time and this was a random party. It was a random, um, friends party. And I was talking with a random guy that I had never met before and never, ever saw again since. Um, and he was, he's like, so you're a singer, you're a trained singer. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, have you ever considered making music, like being a recording artist and making music that way? Because a lot of, you know, a lot of recording artists, they don't actually have good training. They, you know, they're not trained that way. I think you could do really well. Randomly out of the blue. And I was like, and usually I've got some sort of a clever retort of, of some sort for it. But I was like, I think that's absolutely what I should do. So this person, even though I've never, I don't even know who it is, changed the entire course of my life with one 
like seemingly simple conversation um, that pointed me on the trajectory that I've been, stayed on. And this was 16 or 17 years mm-hmm. ago that it just transformed everything for me. Isn't that funny how just the one random encounter can completely change the course of your life? I can point to one or the, one or two of those myself. And it's so cool. It I just, is. It's, I love, um, there's a movie, Sliding Doors, that is uh, Gwyneth, Gwyneth Paltrow. Paltrow. Mm-hmm. And I always think of that, that movie because it was such a brilliant way of showing timelines in that way. And like, what a simple thing. Mm-hmm could change the entire trajectory of of her life and that's definitely what happened for me and it sounds like obviously it's happened for you a few times too yeah well there was a a guy i knew that i barely knew in college who had randomly met my husband on like a subway train and my husband is a, a studio owner he's a recording engineer and producer and he had given this kid his card and i saw this guy like i ran into him when i was visiting some friends at college a year later or something and he remembered me as, oh, you were that singer-songwriter. You know, I met this producer on the train. Um, and 25 years later, I'm married to him. So <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. It's so we had a band for 10 years and you know, we did a whole bunch of touring and, and songwriting together and stuff, and and you know, and we're married, so 20 years. <laughs> Like, Random person. I barely knew this guy. He only ran into my husband the one time ever, and this random business card changed hands, and it's just fate sometimes. It's history. I it love is. it. Yeah, it absolutely. It is. So, okay, so you got this idea in your head, and then how did you how did you find your collaborators and the studio that you settled in? So I, at that moment just started got a keyboard for the first time and just started like tinkering around with that and Mm -hmm. I've always been really good at writing um like very creative stories like kind of fictional stories and and like poems and this always had a bit of a love affair with with words you know different ways to express Mm um so started um playing around with that and then My ex-partner, who I was actually in a romantic partnership with, Mm. we met and connected and he and I, we, he was a bass player and a music producer. Mm -hmm. And then we just started um, creating and collaborating and as our like love for each other bloomed, so did the music. I relate to that. Very hard, as you can imagine. <laughs> yes, of course. I'm so but um, no, that's that's wonderful. So yeah, so you so you do poetry as well, huh? Well, yes, I love um, like it's a poetic way of writing. I'm not sure if I would say that I'm like a poet as much as I draw influence from poetry mm-hmm. in the way that I write. Mm-hmm. So it's like. There's a flourish with the mm-hmm. way that poets are able to weave words mm-hmm. that I definitely resonate with and draw influence from in a big way. Sure. Well, it's great. The, the, the interesting thing about poetry is um, that if you if you have the feel for it, you can distill something really complex down to a simple image or a line or two that just gets you, you know? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely that. And and songwriting is the same. You know, it was to to learn how to say less was one of my biggest lessons, you know, mm-hmm. to be able to refine it. Don't don't say 20 words, say mm-hmm. four that will floor you, mm-hmm. you know, or floor the person yeah. that's listening to it. So, yeah, yeah just yeah. a very, very... Um, honed skill it took a little minute but really got there and understood how how that is and how impactful it is Mm -hmm. yeah i was you know in my 20s when i was doing that and uh i was guilty of being a very wordy songwriter (laughs) (laughs) so you've got so much to say you've got so much of the story to tell and it's like yeah it's um 
you have to understand that when you know the regular the average person is listening to music they don't always have the capacity to take in that much information so you being able to weave one line that cuts through all of the noise of their surroundings of whatever it is. They could be mm-hmm. cleaning the kitchen while listening to the song. They could be doing whatever it is and all of these in a very fast paced world that we live in. Being able to have one line of a song that cuts through and just goes straight to the heart. You're right. like, oh, you really that, need. That's it. That's you've got to have the fine tune. You've mm-hmm. got to have the Cupid's arrow as it were. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. No, that those like the four or five words that'll just punch through the chaos and, and mm-hmm. reach somebody. Because that's what it I mean, that's what it is, right? That's what we do. That's why we do anything creative is we're trying to reach people, right? For sure. Yeah. To create a reaction, to create uh evoke some sort of motion or emotion mm-hmm. in them. Um, so yeah, definitely that. Um now, it's interesting because I, I like talking to uh, actors as well, because there's, you know, the actors, the, the interpreters, the vocalists, they're sort of at the end of the storytelling line in a way, and sometimes they get forgotten. But to my mind, it's sort of like, okay, so if you have a writer who's written this story, the the actor or the singer at the end of it is the one who's making people believe it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So for you, is there a distinction between Desi the performer and singer versus Desi the songwriter? Hmm. That's such a good question. Well, for me, I predominantly am writing for myself. I'm, I've, I've collaborated with so many people over the years, but mm. really with me as the artist in mind. Mm-hmm. But there is something to be said of like, I'm a different energy and persona when I'm on stage mm. than when I am in the stu- in the writing process of the mm-hmm. studio. That it's you almost have to be a lot of the music that I've written is very like soulful and connected in that and a lot of like, you know, emotional components to it. So in some ways you need to be like on your knees in that when you're writing you're like okay i'm gonna rip my heart out and like spread it all over the page like this is what it is and when it comes to performance like you need actually entertainment value as well so you need to be able to kind of make it a little larger than life you need to be able to take what that is and like amplify it out so it it moves them in the moment and you're creating energy and creating momentum and aliveness in that in that moment so i don't believe the two things are mutually exclusive but there's just kind of a little bit of a a different a different um intention well, yeah mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a different headspace kind of. Definitely that. Yes. Definitely. Going from one to the other. Do you, and, and for me, when I was doing it, I, I enjoyed both. Like it felt like a very complete kind of natural thing. And I guess it must be that for you too. Oh, it definitely is. Like it's, I mean, I'd love to sing. It's beautiful, but mm. to be able to sing something that you've created that, you it's a lot of the time I'm drawing influence from my own life you know Mm -hmm. just and being able to weave that into it is just such a beautiful thing so I'm yeah I'm feeling really grateful that I I have the cohesion of those two things coming together so so well Mm -hmm. do you is there though I have to ask um is there though a, a a show that you like that you would go back to the stage for? Hamilton. Hamilton. In an in a heartbeat. <laughs> in a heartbeat. I it's the first show in, I mean, I don't even know how many years that I I've got a very, very different walk of life now. I've got a very mm-hmm. different path. Mm-hmm. And without a doubt, I was like, 
before I leave this earth, I will be in Hamilton. Okay. Like I'm, I'm yeah. going to. Yeah, no, I, I feel you. I feel that. I'm All right, I'm manifesting that for you. Thank you. Hold that vision. <laughs> we got it. Definitely. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, just coming back to the idea of telling, telling your own stories. Um, storytelling serves a lot of purposes for, for people. Um, it can be about solidifying your identity or connecting with others, or, or there could be therapy or catharsis can teach lessons. Um, what would you say? And it can be certainly, I think they are, anybody's storytelling can be more than one of those things, but what would you say is the, the primary job that your songwriting does for you personally and in the world? Mm, such a good question too. Um, so for me, for a long time, songwriting was therapy, for sure. Like just being able to unapologetically say exactly what I'm feeling without needing any sort of reaction from it, needing anything, uh, like having to hold anything back from it, any repercussions or ramifications of what that is, just pure expression of what it was for me. And I spent a lot of my time as a songwriter quite lonely and and yearning for connection companionship and and like there was a real ache in my heart and that and it was just a beautiful thing to be able to put some of that into word and and put it down and move that energy within myself so it didn't feel like it was just stagnantly living in me right because you can drown in that stuff if you're not careful Mm -hmm. oh yeah oh yeah had a couple close calls a couple times <laughs> and always managed to stay above the surface well i'm i'm glad for that that's uh to all our benefits um so i have to ask about because i you do talk a lot you know on your socials where i follow you um about your healing practice mm -hmm. and I wondered a little bit about, well, I have a few questions about it, but um, can you tell me a little bit about what that's like and what you're doing there? Of oh, course. So I am a transformational coach mm -hmm. and a shamanic practitioner. So mm -hmm. energy healing, um, somatic, like recalibration, mm -hmm. um, helping people with trauma and um, different uh, mental and psychological conditions and um you know, and running the gambit from every all different types of clients over the last like three and a half years, mm. um, but ultimately in the name of transformation and mm. and and healing, you know, being able to bring a deeper understanding that everything actually happens to you for a reason, and to help people transition from being a victim of their own story or of the energy around them mm -hmm. and to be empowered by their own story and the energy that surrounds them is within them so it's very very deep it's beautiful um it's challenging mm -hmm. and um it's very uh immersive so really taking people through periods of transformation I feel like that would be something that would involve a lot of vulnerability for you. Mm. Oh, yes. Is that hard? Yeah, it's not really because it's really my purpose. You know, it's mm -hmm. what I'm here to do. So it's very natural for me. I, to, to, I'm the best version of myself when I'm helping and healing and guiding others. That's just mm -hmm. the way that it is. And really understanding that I'm getting to use every asset and every facet of myself mm -hmm. in this, including music, including mm -hmm. singing and vibrational mm -hmm. frequency medicine and using all of these different components and, mm -hmm. and even my love to cook and take care mm -hmm. of people. You know, these are all 
the contributing factors of what can really help people feel supported and mm. and safe. Mm. Right. Well, that's important when you're working at that level with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how would you say? Because it seems like your your healing practice impacts your artistic practice, and you kind of were getting at that a little bit. But give me a little more about that. What is the crossover between those two things? Of course, um, it's funny because I I needed the two things to be separate for quite some time. Mm -hmm. Like I'm very much the music industry is so challenging. It's um, mm -hmm. And I really experienced burnout in a in a major way around music, and just so happened it was at the same time as the lockdown. So I was like, okay, actually, this is perfect. <laughs> I'm like, I was just gonna like take a step away from from the music and really fully step into the healing space. So mm. at that moment, I got certified in pranic healing mm. and worked with an incredible medicine woman who showed me the ways of how to facilitate indigenous medicine mm. and uh, and continued my journey from there and so i needed it to be separate for a bit mm. and then now bit by bit it happened but really now i'm understanding that the two things are not separate at all and i've been putting the frequency of healing and freedom and uh, transformation into the music i've been making all along mm. i just didn't know that that was what it was that i was doing and i've had the most incredible fan mail from people all over the world saying that that my music quite literally saved their life and um, help them navigate painful breakups and and grief and you know all of these different things so it's it wasn't subtle you know but some you just can't see things until you're supposed to see it so i was like oh i think i've been in the frequency of of, of a healer this whole time and i didn't really know that like mm -hmm. fully mm -hmm. So it's interesting because I see this also um, when I talk to people who are working across a lot of different disciplines in their life. Um, at some point, there is sort of a unified theory in a way. You know what I mean? Like yes. there's a thing that goes across all of their work, no matter what it might be. And I feel like it, it feels to me like like healing is that for you, that that's a part of your music and it's a you know, part of the more direct practice. It absolutely is. And I think I'd say more specifically, the frequency of the heart. Mm. That's the thing. Mm. That's the the through line through all of it. It's mm. my most powerful asset to help and heal people. And it's my most powerful asset to write and create from. But without a doubt. Mm the frequency of the heart i like that that should I, I feel like that could be an album title oh my god okay well great um, i'll give you 10 percent. all right <laughs> all right absolutely um no uh but and this is interesting because you know like i am i am a word person um you know i'm i am the person that like actually reads the lyrics when i when I buy an album. Um, and I do see a lot of um, a lot of really interesting stuff. Um, I love the song Higher Heart. I love mm -hmm. that phrase. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit and what that means to you. Of course. So um, that song's written about my late father um, mm. who passed away almost 16 years ago um mm. back when i was living over in london mm. um so that song's dedicated to and is about him mm. and the higher heart in the 
the chakras. Uh, mm. It's like the heart chakra. It's mm. like the fullness of the heart. And it's not, you know, the the physical heart. It's it's the energetic heart. Mm. Um, and really one of the most beautiful things that has happened to me in working as a, you know, as a intuitive clairvoyant person because that's another large part of my work is is the intuition and being able to communicate with energies and spirits mm -hmm. um i i'm in deep close connection with my father and we work together in these ceremonial spaces and and these healing spaces together and it's it's very much like it's our hearts meet mm -hmm. my higher heart is has always been and will always be connected to him and um that's ultimately the the meaning of the song so it's like it's beyond the physical it's um the the love goes on the love lives on it's almost like a sort of um like a spiritual vulnerability mm -hmm. in a way Yes, definitely that. Definitely that. Which I honestly, I think that I think that you need that to be an artist, like a good artist. Oh yeah, for sure. And I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of a lot of heartache and a lot of pain spurs so much creativity because it pulls you into a place or lulls you into a place that you're feeling such intensity, such emotion that you cannot hide from it. You have no choice but to express it. You have to, you have to. And it's really when a lot of artists are in that place that they really feel like they have something to say. And now they've got some, a way to really say it. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it, it breeds authenticity. No. Oh, mm -hmm. Right. hundred percent. And you can feel it. You can really feel it when somebody's, this is a huge influence of mine is Amy Winehouse. Uh, oh, I love her. Huge, huge, huge fan of hers. And she changed my life as a songwriter, as an artist. Mm. And, you know, ultimately her, her pain and her story made that music so good and so soulful but it was really very painful for her to be up performing these songs it wasn't a surface level thing for her so i think ultimately that led to her demise um having to be able to go up and perform and tour and just bang it out it wasn't a thing for her yeah well i mean it's it's very hard to be that raw, you know, 200 nights a year or whatever it was. Yes. Yes, definitely that. And the whole world wanting a piece of you. Yeah. yeah. Which is actually, I think it's wonderful that you sort of balance that life of the artist and the musician with something that's specifically devoted to healing and repairing. And like, I think that, and you know, ultimately that's going to be a great thing for your art. Oh, for sure. And the two things I think I couldn't imagine myself ever getting to the point of burnout mm. you know, that I was without, you know, ever again, you know, um, because I have all of these very soulful, mindful practices and I'm just connected to myself and mm. moved through a lot of my own trauma um in order to be able to heal to the degree that i do with others and help them transform you have to do your own work you have to do your own self-inquiry and figure out your own trauma and stuff like that so i have a deeper sense of freedom and and one of the biggest things i will definitely share and i know you can probably relate to this one mm -hmm. is um the pressure mm. of what it is in the music industry like 
there's so much pressure there's so much fear there's so much like you know it's like yeah now 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 go 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 push 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 and i just refuse now like i'm only gonna do what feels organic what feels in flow and what feels authentic to me i am not tied to any expectation of success with with music like what will happen will happen i believe the music will go out to who it was supposed to go out to and dissolving the idea of ambition around the art mm -hmm. is the only way that i'm available for doing it that's it yeah yeah absolutely there's there's especially when you're a younger musician trying to break through there's this terrible ticking clock that's hanging over everything. Mm -hmm. And oh, yeah. yeah. And I know it well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, and it served me for a time, mm -hmm. you know, until it didn't. Until it was absolutely the thing that drove me to the edge in which I had to take a big step back sure. from, from that. You know? Yeah, it just, it, it has a way of sucking the joy out of everything, you know, it's like, you're doing art because you, you know, you want to express and you want to create and connect and all of this. And you have this persistent thing that's, uh, that's kind of taking away from that. You're spending so much energy kind of slaving for the, the ticking clock. Oh, I have to make it to, to this benchmark by I'm 30 or it's, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. I'm done. Yes. Um, but I feel like freeing yourself from that has kind of worked out well for you, hasn't it? Oh my God, so much so, so much so. It's, I'm the happiest version I've ever been of myself. And I'm the most honest with myself. And now I'm able to connect to music in a completely different way that actually feels deeper mm. and more true. That. Yeah. So, so how has LA been for you in terms of that? And I know you've done really well. You, you're in a bunch of shows now, your songs. Mm -hmm. yes. Um, yes. And how has LA been for the, the other side of Desi, the, 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 shamanic practice the healing practice how has that been i mean it's honestly it's the perfect place for it it's like la is such a a mecca for that mm -hmm. la is such a hub for transformational healing transformational alchemy there's mm -hmm. sound ceremonies and mm -hmm. medicine ceremonies all over the place everybody there's so many different life coaches and different practitioners of all of these different things not necessarily saying that they're all great <laughs> because i think la is also a place in which people come to make it you know somewhat mm -hmm. so having the idea of you know them having some sort of inspiration come through from coaching or an alternative medicine mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. and being like great i'm just going to be a coach now and that's it and it's like mm -hmm. that doesn't necessarily mean that you have the the goods to 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 mm -hmm. hold what this is because we're dealing with trauma we're dealing mm -hmm. with different people's lives their circumstances their energetic makeup all of these other different things so just because there's a lot of it doesn't mean that it's all great quality but there are amazing practitioners there are amazing people kind-hearted open people um and a lot of people that are very open to being clients of things like this and and coming to alternative medicine or alternative approaches uh for their transformation I imagine there's a lot of need for it, actually. <laughs> yes. I don't think there's anywhere, really, any metropolitan city that isn't in need of it. Like, the world, we've got some, we've got some real illumination to, to, 
to do that's available here mm -hmm. um because i probably venture to say that maybe 95 percent of this world don't feel free and fully expressed and connected that's a high number but i think you probably i think you probably hit it on the head and and that we see the positive side of that, that it's like, okay, great. Like, let's go. There are plenty of people that need practitioners like myself and my amazing friends that are all practitioners of different ways and mm -hmm. doing amazing things out in the world. So yes, like it's inspiring in that respect because things are changing, especially after a huge health crisis, a huge lockdown, a huge mm -hmm. global health scare. Mm -hmm. People are more awake and more aware that they're like, okay, what is, there's more to life mm -hmm. than just making a bunch of money and worrying about things. It's like, no, like, what do you, how do you want to design your life? How do you want to feel yeah. in your life? I can't, honestly, I can't help thinking that also, um, the AI revolution is making people think about their own humanity now. Oh, yes. Yeah, you bring up a very, very good point with that. Like, okay, so what is it actually that makes me human? And what is my inherent value as a human? Yeah, it's, it's something in which um, I definitely believe that everything happens just as it's supposed to and you cannot fight evolution and transformation like things mm -hmm. are always going to evolve and i always think back to the people that were resistant to every technological advance that we've had you know sure. the people the radio people were terrified of the tv people and the mm -hmm. and the <clears throat> CD, you know, the uh, vinyl people were terrified mm -hmm. of the idea of the CD and like it, it was all of these things. And it's like, okay, you, this is here for a reason. This is an opportunity to look at what, what is inherently valuable with us, within us, and also to evolve with what's happening, meet it where it's at meet these things where they're, where they're at and it's like it's here i i hope very much so that we're able to truly be smart and discerning about what we release you know i mean it's hilarious that we've seen so many movies and tv shows about <laughs> about like artificial intelligence like taking over <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah. like it's here and we're just like let's do it <laughs> so I'm, like, yeah. Yeah. well you know uh, i'm less worried about that than i am about the people who are telling the artificial intelligence what to do Ooh. oh yeah yeah but that's that's my <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, any any innovation can be, whether it's, you know, in technology or whatever, any innovation can be used in good ways and in not so good ways. And that's been true since the discovery of fire. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I often think of the analogy of the knife, mm -hmm. you know, it's mm -hmm. like in the hands of a world class chef it's um, it's a beautiful thing it's a phenomenal thing in the hands of somebody with an intent and a murderer it, it's a very very harmful thing but you can't be like no more knives you know like it's like no we actually have to get into the the mindset of the people the 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 head the heart as to who they are rather than the the thing the object itself um so my feeling is and i don't know probably i think you would agree is that even though ai can generate music and books and whatever else 
that people will never stop making art. It's it's imperative for us. That I, that's the one thing that for for a prime example, the vinyl, mm. like how much how de- vinyls have completely out out lived cds even though cds were the biggest thing in the whole thing people aren't even producing cds anymore they're just like really not it's Mm -hmm. like a tiny fraction of that um and that there's something about capturing the essence of the energy of what that is and that's why vinyl has outlived and that's why it continues on and saying in fact it's having a whole resurgence a whole, whole big boom I believe the same thing of human art because we we're random, you know. We are the the inspiration that kind of comes through us is something connected to divine spirit and the pool of creativity. It's like art has created many movements and if it's purely just coming from a bunch of data put into a thing, it's never going to have the same soul. I just, I just don't believe that it ever will have the same soul. Yeah. I, I, I agree with that. And I think the stories that we need to tell, we need to tell for a reason. Mm Mm-hmm. And other people are going to, you know, connect to that. Um, so I have to ask you: Do you think? Do you see yourself making another album in the coming year or two? Yes, I definitely do. Mm-hmm. It's been percolating for a while. I believe taking who I am now as as a healing artist as well as a recording artist and weaving those together but in a in a way that maybe you wouldn't ever know you know to listen to it you wouldn't be like oh this is but on a soul level you will connect to it and the the codes and the and the frequencies that i am as a as a medicine man, as a practitioner of of this work is part of me. So everything that I write, everything that I sing, everything that I play will be in the frequency, will be steeped in that because that's who I am. And that will come through in the album for sure. Okay. What kind of stories do you think you might be telling on that next journey? Oh, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always been, yeah, I've always been taken by the idea of love. Mm. So I know that that's going to be a beautiful piece of it mm. all. Um but the actual storytelling piece, I really don't know. Mm. I, yeah, I, a part of me knows, but mm. it's not. You have not access to that part yet. I haven't. I haven't channeled that yet. Um, but I'm excited about it. Okay, cool. That's a perfectly terrific and valid answer. Um <laughs> I mean, you know, for me, I, I know any, if anyone asks me that, it's, yeah, there's like about 10 things back there that I've put a pin in. And we'll see yes. what actually comes out. <laughs> <laughs> it's the cork board, the back of the mind. Exactly. Yeah, I got you. Um, so, all right. I'm going to ask you one more thing about um, one of your songs. Um before we move on to show and tell. Mm, um, yes. What is the story behind Fate Don't Know You? Because that's probably your biggest song and that's 
gotten the most play for you. Um, but I wonder about what it's really about. It's a very um, interesting story. I'm glad you asked this question. So I was going through a little bit of a harder time um, with with music at the time. So mm. uh, it was a lot of like, okay, you know, trying to break into the industry at that moment. Um, and it was the first time of me collaborating with now my, you know, one of my favorite producers and an incredible dear friend and brother of mine, um, Rune Westberg. Mm -hmm. um, he was the producer and co-writer of the song and, and another co-writer, um, Nana, Nathan Wise, his name is. Mm -hmm. um, this is the first time we'd ever met each other. This is the first, mm -hmm. and the vocals that we cut on that day are the vocals that are in the song. No kidding. If the whole thing from soup to nuts was oh. created and recorded, including the vocals, in five or six hours. Just this came through. And we're getting into the mindset of I was speaking from my personal experience where it was mm. like, I'm seeing this resistance. I'm feeling this resistance from breaking into the music industry from what that is. Mm -hmm. And it's like, if this is meant for me, why is it feeling so challenging? Why is it feeling so difficult? Mm -hmm. And it really brought up the idea of fate. Mm -hmm. And can you ultimately, can you fight fate? Can you go against what is fated for you? And being able to say, you know what? Fate does not know what I'm made of or what this is. Mm. I know. So we made the, the narrative of it at like a love story. So we took that same, that very concept and made it that a fortune teller is basically telling you that you're going to have everything you've ever wanted. Mm. You're going to have everything you ever dreamed, but you're not going to have the love of your life that you're with right now. Mm. And you being in such a state of, there's no way, there's, I don't care what fate says. Mm. Fate doesn't know my love the way that I do and that was that was how it was born so we were kind of like we started to play the instruments and play uh, Rune was on the keys and uh, me and Nana were kind of like moving some like doing some like melodies and some things and then just it just plugged in and the song just came out like mm -hmm. the first few lines of the song just came out and just were perfect as they were the, exactly the version you're hearing right there wow and um yeah it really tied up so much of like a real emotion because everybody can relate to that of of somebody fe feeling so connected to something that you're like, I know it's for me. I know it. It doesn't matter what fate says. I know it's for me. Um, so yeah, that's the, the backstory from it and just the way that it flowed and, and still blown away that it, they are the vocals from that day, you know, and it was in 2015. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's one of those instances where the, the clouds parted and the beam of light came down and it was, oh, ah, yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's amazing. It's definitely not. That's a, that's a, I mean, the whole, the whole thing from, from top to bottom in five, six hours is, is incredible. And how much that song has changed every aspect of my life mm. and continues to do so. It's still 
one of the most magical things that's ever happened to me in my life was that song being created and and the moment that it hit the screens and 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 aired and my life has just never been the same since did you did you know you had something when you finished yeah undoubtedly mm. Like, I was like, this is something, this is outrageous. I was mm. like, this feels like we could, like, like, this is, feels like an Adele song. Like, that's mm. what it felt like. It felt mm. like this, yes. This type yes. of a majestic, um, you know, majesty to it. Mm. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, it's an unignorable song in that respect. Um, yeah, we, we knew it. And I, Played it for my man, sent it to my management at the time, and they freaked out. And everybody freaked out <laughs> about the song. Um, yeah, just just had the thing. Yeah, fantastic. I love that. Um, so we're coming up on time. Um, did you bring something for show and tell? I did. <laughs> I did. I did. I did. So let me just bring it up here. I feel really excited that I'm getting a chance to uh, to read this and to speak this. <clears throat> Beautiful. You know what? I'm just going to bring it up here on the screen. Do what you have to do. <laughs> Can you still see me? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, perfect. you're good. Perfect. So I I will be um, reading Still I Rise by Maya Angelou. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of the tides, just like Hopes springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes? Shoulders falling like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Because I laugh (laughs) like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I write. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance? like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thigh. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise up from a past that rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide leaving behind nights of terror and fear i rise into a daybreak that's wondrously clear i rise bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave i am the dream i am the hope of the slave i rise i rise i rise Wonderful. Thank you.
very first time I've ever uh, read Simai Angelo out loud to yeah. everyone before. So that was a real honor. So thank you for bringing that bringing that into the space. Well, thank you. I'm I, I'm I'm so thrilled that you shared that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, actually, would you mind um, if I if I shared that reading on the page? Oh, please, 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 please. I would I would Wonderful. be honored. I would be honored. Wonderful. Um, as you because as you know, I'm a big promoter of poetry, and and I think that would be a really terrific thing to have on there. She's a she's a hero of mine. And that yeah, and that particular. That particular poem, I think, has got a certain universality to it. It really does. We can overcome anything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. So, uh, last thing. Um, one of the other things that's sort of part of the format is I like to sometimes do a lightning round at the end. Ooh, I love a lightning round. And so what this is, is I am going to give you two classic soul singers, and you have to tell me which one you prefer, and you have to just say it. You can't think about it. You just Ooh. have to say it. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Ready. All right. All right. Ready? Yes. Okay. Stevie Wonder or Marvin Gaye? Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder or Sam Cooke? Sam Cooke. Marvin Gaye or Sam Cooke? Sam Cooke. Marvin Gaye or James Brown? Marvin Gaye. Stevie Wonder or James Brown? Stevie Wonder. Awesome. <laughs> it's, so fun, but it's, it's tough because they were all legendary, amazing, but mm -hmm. I'm, yeah. Feeling I'm some clear, yeah. I'm some real, clear. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, I can see kind of who your guys are. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> yeah, you can probably listening to my music. You can definitely, you can definitely tell some of those too. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you sort of sit. Not that you sound exactly like them, but you sort of sit in this tier of of modern people that I like, like you know, Raphael Sadiq, and mm -hmm. you know, some of those other guys that are reaching back to that classic sound. Yes, definitely that. Definitely that. We love a throwback. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right, I'm going to do a sign off. Um, if you want to stick around for a minute after I finish that and stop with the recording and everything, that would be awesome. Um, but uh, all right. Uh, so this has been uh, a wonderful time talking with you. Thank you for geeking out with us. Once again, I have been your host, Jen Jackalone, and this has been the Geek Girl Story Salon. We are available here on YouTube and everywhere where podcasts are found. Take care, you beautiful people, and stay geeky. Bye. <laughs>